Hello and welcome to Dogs with Torches, episode 12. If you could live during any historical period of time, be it ancient, modern, or contemporary, of which would you choose? In this episode, we will be discussing the period of time in Japanese history known as the Feudal Era, and the rise of the military shogunate in the late 12th century. We will examine the different military houses who came to power at this time and discuss their eventual decline. Thank you all so much for listening, and enjoy the podcast episode. In this episode, we will be relying heavily on R.H.P. Mason's A History of Japan, and we will primarily be focusing on the military and political aspects at this time, with some mention of the Japanese economy and culture. Now before we discuss the military families and the shogunate, we should first define by what we mean when we say that Japan was feudal. According to Mason, quote, Japanese feudalism was to be distinguished by fiefs, vassalage, and a marked military ethos in culture as well as politics. However, fiefs in the sense of compact areas of land held under the authority of a military overlord were not a feature of its early development. It was the institution of vassalage, and above all, the conduct and loyalty of individual vassals that enabled the heads of military houses in the fullness of time to govern Japan, displacing the civil aristocracy. Originally, vassals were simply men who protected the Shoan estates and ensured their safety, slowly in time becoming loyal to prominent military families such as the Minamoto and the Taira. In addition to this, the vassalage class was originally seen to be quite loyal to the imperial authorities, and they were sometimes enlisted to quell rebellions in the provinces by the court. However, in time, they would grow to be much more dependent upon their feudal lords rather than the court, and this was mostly because the vassal's income was coming out of the pocket of their lords rather than the court. Loyalty of the vassals was bought by monetary compensation for their assistance in government and war. We find such examples of such loyalty in the 11th century disputes between the Minamoto family and the Abe family. Under the leadership of Minamoto Yoriyoshi, who lived from 988 to 1075, the Minamoto clan fought against the Abe family who had begun to oppose the interests to the court at the time. One account of the battle reads as follows, quote, There was a warrior in Yoriyoshi's army called Sinori, a man from Sagami province, whom Yoriyoshi had always treated generously. Though Sinori had broken through the victorious enemies around him, he had barely managed to escape and knew nothing about what had happened to Yoriyoshi. He questioned a soldier who said, The general is surrounded by rebels. Only five or six men are with him, and it is hard to see how he can get away. For 30 years now I have been in Yoriyoshi's service, said Sonori. I am 60, and he is almost 70. If he must die, I intend to share his fate and go with him to the underworld. He wheeled and entered the enemy cordon. End quote. Now to what extent this story is accurate, or how willing the vassals were to die for their lord, is of course a matter of dispute. But nevertheless, the mark of vassalage was their dedication and loyalty to their lord and their respective cause. And slowly these vassals were shown to confess more loyalty to them than the emperor himself. 
In 1156, the Tyra family rose to power during what is known as the Hogan Disturbance, where the Tyra and the Minamoto clan fought to determine the succeeding emperor, and the previous ruling Fujiwara clan were ousted and reduced in status and power. After that, in 1159 to 1160, in what is known as the Heiji Disturbance, the Taira family crushed the Minamoto family, which sought to oppose their influence over the courts. After the death of Emperor Naijo in 1165, the Taira family would become a powerful ally to the court, and they were to rise in prominence during the mid-12th century. Emperor Go Shirakara would succeed Naijo, and his right-hand man was to be the head of the Taira household, Taira no Kiyomori. Now, Kiyomori was in many ways continuing the tradition of familial ties to the court, just as the Fujiwara had done. Kiyomori made it a point to avoid any sort of domineering or overreaching attitude in his influence over the court, and he allowed the emperor to make most of the decisions himself. But due to his influence, he would be the one to arrange the marriages in the court such that his children would marry prominent members of the court, just as the Fujiwara had done. Indeed, due to his influence, he became both the head of the now-defeated Fujiwara family and the grandfather of the future emperor. In this way, we can see that much like the Fujiwara before them, the House of Taira was to gain influence by closely allying themselves with the court and arranging the matches for marriage. Unfortunately for the House of Taira, their influence would prove to be short-lived, as the Minamoto family, while broken down in the mid-12th century, were far from being finished, and in the late 12th century, we will see the Minamoto return to power. Minamoto no Yoshitsune, who lived from 1159 to 1189, would be one of the two leading men in the Minamoto family who would overthrow the Taira family and establish their reign and connection to court. His military victories are recorded in the Japanese epic The Heki Monogatari, which portrays Yoshitsune as a great war hero and the Taira family as a decadent and depraved set of despots. Taken from the Heki Monogatari, the epic reads a story about Yoshitsune's bravery. Quote, In the course of his fighting, the Hogan, Yoshitsune somehow or other dropped his bow into the sea and leant out of the saddle, trying to pick it up again with his whip. His companions cried out to him to let it go, but he would not, and at last managed to recover it and rode back laughing to the beach. The older warriors reproached him for this, saying, How valuable a bow might be, what is that in comparison with our lord's life? It was not that I grudged the bow, replied Yoshitsune, and if my bow were one that required two or three men to bend it, like that of my uncle Tametomo, they would be quite welcome to it. But I should not like a weak one like mine to fall into the hands of the enemy, for them to laugh at it and say, this is the bow of Kuro Yoshitsune, the commander-in-chief of the Genji, and so it was that I risked my life to get it back. And this explanation drew expressions of approval from all. The success of Yoshitsune would culminate with his defeat of Taira in a series of naval battles in 1185, and most of the Taira family would be wiped out in the course. In the aftermath, Yoshitsune's brother Minamoto no Yoritomo, who lived from 1147 to 99, would become the chief architect for the restoration of Minamoto authority and power with respect to the imperial court. Traditionally, Yoshitsune has been depicted as the great architect behind the Minamoto restoration, but in actual fact, it would be Yoritomo who would lay the foundation for a new system of governance which would become epical in defining Japanese politics for the coming centuries. This would be the creation of the Bakufu, or the Shogunate State. Yoritomo would eventually execute his brother Yoshitsune on charges of alleged treason, and he was to become the sole ruler of the Minamoto family, after which Yoritomo would set his sights on changing the governmental system of Japan molding it from a centralized imperial system to a militarized one. Yoritomo would first move the base of operation away from the court in Kyoto and would move to the city of Kamakura. There, he would develop the Bakufu system and enlarge the family's influence over the vassals and provinces. Yoritomo first began by establishing the office of samurai, which were military officers charged with managing the vassal class. In addition to this, Yoritomo also set up constables, who would manage the provinces and make sure to quell any uprisings that would occur. Finally, in an effort to establish himself as the unquestioned ruler of the military ethos, Yoritomo was bestowed by the court the title of Sei Taishogun, 
This was an enormous display of power and authority to be bestowed the title of Shogun. To quote Mason, quote, Whoever had held the title of Shogun in the past had been empowered to wage war on the Ainu frontier, but Yoritomo was commissioned to govern a country that had been restored to peace. Whoever had held the title in the past had surrendered a sort of office once a particular frontier campaign was over. But Yoritomo intended to remain Shogun for life. What is more, it was widely understood that he would pass his rank onto his heirs. Unquote. What had traditionally been viewed as a title for war, similar to the Roman title of dictator, had now become a hereditary office bestowed upon the family's descendants. What is more, Yoritomo had developed a system of governance which had outgrown the need for reliance upon the older imperial court, and had developed a militarized government independent of the court's authority. Unfortunately for the shogunate, the imperial court was not to take this shifting of power lightly. And as we shall soon see, later controversies will result concerning the reach of the imperial court's authority versus the authority of the shogunate. Now after the reign of Yoritomo, the Minamoto would lose whatever power they had once wielded, as the successors to Yoritomo were not as strong as their predecessor. Because of this, the power and managing of the Bakufu would be exercised not by the shogun, but by regents of the shogun, in this case, the Hojo regents. This began the period of time known as the Hojo Regency. During the Hojo Regency, tensions would begin to develop between the court and the now autonomous Bakufu, such that the emperor at the time would try to openly rebel against the shogunate's decisions and their managing of estates. Emperor Gotoba, who lived from 1180 to 1239, was the first emperor to try to oppose the shogunate, and attempted to regain the power the court had once wielded in the Heian period. Now, during the reign of Yoritomo, just prior to the Hojo Regency, Yoritomo had bequeathed a number of estates to Hojo Yoshitoki, the head of the Hojo family. But rather than recognize the legitimacy of the Hojo's ownership over these estates, Gotoba decided to give these lands away to his favorite dancing girl. With this, the emperor was now openly rebelling against the shogunate, as he did not recognize the legitimacy of the Hojo's land rights over these estates. Now openly contemptuous of Hojo authority, and by extension that of the shogunate, the emperor declared war on Yoshitoki and the rest of the Bakufu. Unfortunately for him, the Bakufu were far too powerful at this time, and rallying the other military families to his aid, Yoshitoki easily defeated the emperor's rebellion and exiled him onto the Oki Islands. And what this fiasco shows is that not only were the Bakufu and the court distinct from one another in power and authority, but the former was capable of removing the latter if push came to shove. Whereas familial clans in the past had always formed deep bonds with the emperor, such as the Fujiwara and the Taira, the Bakufu at this time were now an autonomous governmental structure, which had gone beyond the need to depend upon the court for their legitimacy. After the debacle, several princes were reinstated at the imperial courts in order to replace Emperor Gotoba in 1221. The princes swore to be loyal to the Hojo family in exchange for what limited power they still possessed. After Yoshitoki's death, the Kamakura shogunate managed to govern functionally and well. During this period, a set of laws called the Joei Code were implemented in 1232, and because of the code, the legal system was to be improved upon during the reign of the Hojo. Now, while for a time there was a limited sense of peace and right governance, the Hojo Regency was to be challenged by foreigners in the coming decades, and the Bakufu would have their authority contested by Kublai Khan and the Mongol invaders. In 1264, Kublai Khan had conquered much of the Asian continent at this time, and he demanded that the Japanese government recognize his authority over them. Specifically, he sent letters to the court demanding that Japan recognize his legitimate authority over them as part of his empire. The court rather hastily consented to the proposals, but the shogunate never gave any explicit reply. Taking this as an implicit rejection of his authority, Kublai Khan sent his troops to conquer the Japanese island and to forcefully subjugate the shogunate to his authority. The first Mongol invasion began in 1274 in November, and fortunately for the Japanese, a storm came and destroyed most of the Mongols' fleet. After this, Kublai Khan attempted to send a mission to demand the emperor to submit, which upon arriving, the missioners were quickly beheaded by the Hojo Regency. In 
And after that, the Mongols were sent to invade the Japanese islands again, and for two months after landing in 1281, they fought against the shogunate stationed at the coast of Kyushu. Unfortunately for the Mongols, a, a gigantic tsunami came and annihilated a large portion of the Mongol fleet. And after the typhoon, or the kamikaze as it was dubbed by the Japanese, the Mongols left Japan alone and did not attempt to invade the island again. And while the Hojo Regency had a difficult time in the beginning, the defeat of the Mongol army was one of their greatest achievements during their reign. But unfortunately for them, it also proved to be one of their greatest setbacks. Because while the tsunami wiped out most of the Mongols' fleet, it also prevented the Hojo from collecting the spoils of war, and thereby providing military compensation for their vassals. After the war with the Mongols, the Hojo Regency started to decline in power. Due to the inability to compensate their vassals for their services, the Bakufu were financially unstable at this time. In addition to this, the other military families were becoming more and more antagonistic towards the ruling Hojo family. And if that wasn't enough, the emperor at the time decided that it was time to follow in Go Toba's footsteps and rebel against the Bakufu. Emperor Go Daigo, who lived from 1288 to 1339, decided he was going to try to restore the imperial court back to its prestige prior to the shogunate. Early attempts to commandeer power failed, and similar to Gotoba, Go Daigo was exiled to the Oki Islands. But uh, unlike Gotoba, Go Daigo was not about to let his banishment be the end of it. And along with his son, Go Daigo returned to the Japanese mainland along with his son, and he rallied troops to oppose the Bakufu, and he fought against the Hojo. With a sudden burst of rebellion, other military leaders began to lose respect for the Hojo, and they decided to oppose the Hojo Regency in the end. In 1333, the last of the Hojo regents were killed, and the emperor was briefly restored to power. While the emperor enjoyed a brief reign and ascent to power in 1333, in the aftermath of the Hojo Regency, he was once again deposed by another military family, this time that of the Ashikaga clan. Ashikaga Takeuji decided to imprison the emperor in the capital. Go Daigo, who at this point we can imagine was getting really tired of all these military families trying to depose him, fled to the south of the capital and set up what is known as the Southern Court. Now this Southern Court was to oppose the Bakufu and was a great nuisance to the Ashikaga. While the emperor was in the south, the Northern Court was still able to function and Ashikaga Takauji was appointed the next shogun by the northern court emperor. Because of the constant warring against the southern court, who at this time had amassed enough resources to oppose the Ashikaga, Takauji had to both manage the shogunate and fight the opposing courts at the same time, a feat which proved to be quite difficult for the young shogun. In response to the threat of the southern court, Takauji made some changes to the shogunate. Takauji appointed what are called shugo, or constables, which were in charge of managing the provinces while Takauji was busy with, with the southern court. In addition to this, Takauji moved the capital away from Kamakura down to the south near Kyoto, in a city called Muromachi. And while Takauji was busy with the southern court, the shugo, or constables, were slowly acquiring more power and authority for themselves in the provinces, and they began to act like daimyo or territorial lords, who instead of simply acting like the extended police of the Bakufu, began to tax many of the estates that they were put in charge of managing. And in the meantime, Takauji continued to fight against the southern court, which continued on after his death. Indeed, it would not be until Ashikaga Yoshimitsu, who lived from 1358 to 1408, that the northern court and the southern court would eventually reconcile. Under the reign of Ashikaga Yoshimitsu, the Ashikaga house prospered, and the Bakufu regained much of its composure in its governing. He demanded that the constables appointed in his predecessor's reign submit to his authority under threats of violence, and he established trading missions between Japan and Ch China, thus rectifying all the economic crises the Bakufu were struggling with at the time. If that were not enough, he successfully united the two opposing courts in the north and the south in 1392. He brought the southern court's emperor back to Kyoto, where he renounced his kingship and formally recognized the northern emperor. Thus, the political crisis, which had plagued the Ashikaga since the time of Takauji, finally came to an end. Unfortunately, 
While the Ashikaga would reach its peak in the late 14th century, it would quickly lose its power in the 15th century, during what is known as the Sengoku Jidai, or the Warring States. So now we finally reach the collapse of the Ashikaga shogunate and the beginning of the Warring States era. This was a period that is most famous for the burning and destruction of Kyoto, the slaughter of most of the military families, the rise of the Sengoku daimyo, and of course, Inuyasha. Now while the Ashikaga shogunate finished off strong in the late 14th century, by the mid-15th century, it had slowly lost most of its power and authority. After the assassination of Shogun Ashikaga Yoshinori in 1441, his successors would prove to be quite inept in controlling the interests of the Bakufu. What resulted from this inept leadership was the famous Onin War, from 1467 to 1477, which lasted for almost 11 years. Now, the Onin War was a conflict between the Hosokawa and the Yamana, on who would control the Bakufu. This bloody war, which lasted for almost 11 years, took place in Kyoto, and as a result of the violent battle, much of the city was destroyed. The current shogun at the time, Ashikaga Yoshimasa, had virtually little power, and the strength of the title of the shogun was merely nominal in essence at this point. After the war, the Hosokawa were the remaining victors. But what resulted from this great war was the destruction of the majority of other military houses. The Shugo daimyo at this time fell out of power in the provinces, the royal family was poverty-stricken, and the city of Kyoto was reduced to rubble. The court was said to be so poor that according to one account, quote, common people made tea and sold it in the garden of the imperial palace, unquote. Now what resulted out of the collapse of the Ashikaga Bakufu was the emergence of a new social class, the Sengoku Daimyo, or the Territorial Lords. While the previous Shugo Daimyo were swept away, the Sengoku Daimyo would replace them as the principal governing force in the province. Now, unlike the Ashikaga-appointed Shugo, the Daimyo would completely ignore the wishes of the capital, or the Bakufu, and would govern autonomously in the aftermath of the Sengoku Jidai. Rather than being assigned land, the daimyo would control and own most of the, their land, similar to fiefs, and they would make their own laws and regulations without the consent of the capital. Now, while their lands that they controlled were much smaller and more compact, they nevertheless were sufficient for governing and maintaining, and soon much of the provinces were to be broken up into these daimyo-controlled territories. So what we find in the medieval era of Japanese history is the emergence of military families vying for imperial power. Eventually up overcoming the need for the court's authority, the office of shogun was developed and the military structure of the bakufu governed autonomously from the influence of the court. In the end, however, the shogun's title in the late Ashikaga's reign would become nominal in essence, and power over the shogunate would be fought for over 11 years. In the aftermath, the new class of daimyo resulted and had broken up the provinces of Japan into smaller territories and tracts of land. Thank you all so much for listening to this episode of Dogs with Torches. Admittedly, this one took a little bit longer to make, but I hope that you all enjoyed it. What should be next on the agenda is Thomas Aquinas' poetry, and to finish off this year, we might do an episode on the 14th century plagues and the Great Mortality. Be sure to like, subscribe, and share with your friends, because as the angelic doctor says, just as it is better to illuminate than merely to shine, so too is it better to pass on what one has contemplated than merely to contemplate. Thank you all so much for listening, and God bless.